if you give yourself something to do with your life, you'll find it all right. You will find what you have planned for yourself in your life, an abundance of it, an overwhelming abundance of it, it will be, unfortunately, all yours. If you have given, let's go real slow on this, don't miss it. If you give yourself the plans, the course by which you're going to spend your life here on earth, if you give it to yourself, of course you're going to have it. And look at the result right now. I said, if you give it, I should change that to because you did give yourself certain plans, certain objectives, certain desires to go after. You got them, didn't you? Do you know what you ask for when you make your own plans? You ask for a perpetuation, for a repetition of everything that you have seen your parents and friends and relatives live by and suffer from. Are you aware that you have found what you sought, what you asked for, what you prayed for? You always get it. Of course you do. You ask for you and more of you, and that's what you end up with. Isn't that a tragedy? Now, let's just say that you are aware of this trick that you've played on yourself and you say to yourself if I don't want more of what I have you know well you know what I'm talking about don't you all that suppression you have which is in your faces right now all that looking around Look, you sit here in this very room and look for entertainment with someone across the room by looking at their face. Let's suppose you're a little bit conscious that this is what you're doing. And a certain intelligence comes to you that instead of you asking for your own plans based on your conditioning, based on falsehoods, based on delusions, suppose you say, I am not going to keep my mind going in making these same requests all the time. I'm going to slow it down, not repeat the requests, just to see what happens. If you do that, instead of asking for your own plans and getting them with all the tears, and all the heartache and all the anger, all the anger, huh? you're loaded with it. Instead of receiving a self-induced plan, you will have something else that is literally, actually, out of this world. And I'll tell you what it is. Instead of being a plan, it is called it is called a purpose. When you have your plan, you have no purpose at all in life. Do you see it? You have no purpose. You have no meaning. You have nothing solid under your feet. All you have is thoughts. All you have is ideas and anxieties. All you have is a whirling around in your mind. What do you suppose makes people irritable? What do you suppose makes them a, a pathetic man, a pathetic woman walking down the street with their vacant eyes and their empty lives? What do you suppose causes that? Listen to what I'm telling you. I'm trying to tell you already that you have had only yourself created plans, which is your tragedy, when you could stop all that and have a purpose. 
something is required of you. What is required is a cessation of self-idolization. When you say, I'm going to keep myself occupied for today with making money, with making wrath, with making self-pity. When you say, I'm going to occupy myself with that to get me through this day. When you say that, who are you appealing to? You're appealing to the only thing you know, which is that complex and disastrous network of plans that you have plenty of reserves, of course. You have endless reserves, a thousand things to do in case one thing fails. But you were so terrified lest one thing fail, you keep that foremost in front of you all the time. And I'll simplify it for you. When one plan that you have to get this or to get that, to advance in the world or whatever it might be, when that seems in danger of veering off the path you have set for it, you have your emergency plan ready. And in simple language, what that emergency plan is, which you put into operation, is called worry. If you can worry, you are occupied, and what an incredible human situation it is that when a human being runs out of his toy, of this plan, this desire, this objective, he doesn't think he's going to get it, and he doesn't have another one quite ready yet. He worries. At the end of this talk, I'm going to give you a, an extra valuable exercise that will cancel all this out, but for now. Where would you say, if you answer this to yourself, I've explained certain things to you, but I want you to explain to yourself now. What is the source of all your present programs for living the rest of your life. You know very well what the source is. The only thing you have, the only thing you have, you see, is you, what you call you, which you've accumulated over the years, and which you, you in your refusal to explore spiritually, say, this is it, this is all there is, this is what I have to resort to, I always have to go back to the same blueprints. I want you to know, and I'm going to emphasize this, I want you to know that there's something very deeply, darkly wrong with you that wants, that wants things to go wrong. There is something in you that doesn't want an answer at all. Who do you think you're kidding? That you say you want to read these books and listen to these talks and you want to gain wisdom and elevate your attitudes and find out more about, about life and about yourself so as to get rid of your problems. Your problems are your most priceless possessions. Because it is possible, and I know this, it is possible for you to drop them, to drop that worry. And to have no resource, no resource at all to turn to, to fill up the gap. No worry to grab onto and say, I'll, I'll be anxious about that, I'll be frustrated about that. It is possible for a human being here in this life, it is possible for you to not fall down ever again. Now, I better tell you something very serious. The way you're going, you, you have sold your soul. You, you have sold it for what you have met so far. And because what you have met so far is you, all you know is you, I tell you. You know nothing else but you, and everything out in that world is in relationship to you. The good news about finances, don't you immediately connect it? Can I make an extra dollar? 
the bad news about finance. Oh, is it going to cost me some money? You try to think something outside of practical thought, which on rare occasions you may think. You try to think of something and see how it always refers back to what you call you. Therefore, that is the center of your life. That is the very cunning, concealed plan by which you say, this is the way I'm going to go for the rest of my life. We're here in this room to try to tell you that there is a way for you to not do that. To refuse absolutely to go along with you anymore. How pathetic that you have taken, I know you have and you know you have, that you have taken the white flag and held it up and said, I quit. Well, I don't, I'm talking personally, I don't care what, at all what any of you do in this room or what the rest of the four billion people and the rest of this globe do. I'm not going to join you. And I never have. See, you come to this very hall itself and I know by the way you look by the way you sit in that chair, by your physical position, your posture, by the expression on your face, by what you talk about, by the weakness in your face and in your manner. Boy, I'll tell you, nothing delights me more than to know that I don't have to have a thing to do with any one of you and I don't intend to. I'm talking about psychological association. Someday, you stick with it. Someday you're going to understand what it means for you to say from your heart, from your very innermost being, you're going to know consciously what it means for you so one day look out into that world and understand your own conscious vow to that parent, to that child, to that spouse, to everyone out there. There's a lot of emotion in it and it's very calm at the same time. If you can understand that, you are not going to infect me anymore because I understand what you're doing. I understand it's the only thing you can do. And from this day on, you and I might have a physical association. We might have a relationship in the family, by a relative, something like that. But I'll guarantee you, sir or madam, I'll guarantee you that I have run out of my own plans and for the last time I've picked up one from you because you've understood where you got the disastrous courses that have wrecked your life. You've picked them up. Ah, you were so delighted. You get so excited and still do. Someone comes along with some little plan, some little scheme to get you through even five hours and you leap on it or your own depression comes along. Your depression and gloom and worry comes along and says, I will give you something to do for the next five hours and you sell your soul for it. We talked the other night about you fighting for yourself. When is it going to begin? When, when are you going to find out for yourself that you don't have to remain you? That you, that you both love and hate at the same time and you understand exactly what I'm talking about because you're so protective of it. You hear the truths coming into this room. You hear them coming in a certain part of you and you're not aware of it at all. It throws up the little shield so that the truth can't get through and you feel good. You feel as if you've protected something valuable 
Anything you have to protect in you is trash. Why don't you drop the shield? Why don't you let it do what's worse? See, this is, this is something you've never dared to do, is to, is to let any thought, a, any experience come to you and say, go ahead and do your worst, anything you want. I am so sick and tired of fighting you, I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm going to understand you. I'm going to understand you all the way out of existence. Ah, because I'm not playing your game anymore, and I'm not playing the game that was my game, because I went along with it. I agreed with it. I agreed to join the fighting. Ah, and about this time a prayer will begin inside of you and that prayer will say something like this I don't I don't care any longer what happens to me as a result of determining to stay awake instead of falling asleep I don't care what happens to me as a result I am never again going to resort to worry to fear to anger to hostility to violence in my mind, in my spirit, in my emotions, I am never again going to fall into that trap. I'm going to stay wide awake. And when you do, you'll understand what you're doing, which is to the glory of your life. To the Ah, you've heard the glory of God a lot. You never understood it. The glory of God itself, because now you're connected with it and you understand that the glory of God in you staying awake is a stage in which you're beginning to rise above yourself. You're no longer that wretched little coward that says, well, one of the, my most favorite plans in my past life was to fall into anxiety. Now look, listen to me. You do indeed have a choice. I tell you, you do. You have a choice to not fall into anxiety when that thought comes into your mind, when that experience comes into your life, when that, that problem person comes along with something that used to disturb you. Why, please, please, why are you selling your soul 50 times a day. It's because you don't understand that you don't have to do it. I am telling you, you don't have to do it. Stop doing it. Stop resorting to yourself. Stop referring to yourself. Stop thinking that anything good com can come from your present human nature. It can't. It never will. Please stop being a sick little egotist and stop being afraid. And that's your court of last resort. If I can't do anything else, I can always be afraid. And by that means, I can hang on to my blueprints that I've so carefully built up over the years. I can hang on to them and now I continue, can continue to feel like me because all I have ever known is a me that trembles. How grateful you... Listen to this. You're saying to yourself, how grateful I am that I have fear to fall back on. Well, if that's what you want, you are indeed a pathetic, lost human being who has settled it, presently at least, settled it that this is the way it is and this is where I'm going to stay. Because, because I feel safe with myself. You're so safe. You're so safe that you're worried that you'll go mad. Go mad, you already are. Any human being with plans is mad. He's insane. He's living on a false foundation. See, when you don't have a spiritual purpose, you know you don't. 
you know that there's something lacking, empty, hungry inside of you. And because you refuse to come to truth, then you turn back to your sick friends and your own sick mind, resort to that and keep the whole mess going. I'll tell you a story that will illustrate what we're talking about up to this point. There was a country ruled over by a king, and the king, the king was a planner, a planner in his own life, and he schemed to become a king with his own plans and finally made it. And he ruled over his people with plans. Now, as I explain this to you, would you uh, search your memory a little bit and tell me whether it sounds familiar, connected with the world that you're now living in? So the king said to his people, look, I know we have crime. I know we have poverty. I know you go to bed hungry, a lot of you. I know that this is a pretty terrible country just now. But loyal citizens, I have plans. And one year we're going to have twice the food. In two years, everyone's going to have a fine home. In three years, we'll have abolished crime so that you don't have to fear walking down the street at night. Everything is going to be just fine. And being a cunning king, he sent his ministers out around the country with big books of plans in it. And they gave big, big lectures and told people how everything, everything was going to be better tomorrow. Never mind the present, they said. Stay away from the present and hope for tomorrow. And this is what they did. And the things continued the way they were. People, people look, even today, do you understand the parallels? People today in this country and every other country don't understand this is what you've been promised all your life and your father and your grandfather promised all your life. Things are going to be different, better tomorrow, and they never are. Have you ever saw that simple thing? That one simple thing, you tell that, you give this simple message to millions of Americans, and they say, you know, that's right, and they go right back to praising the king, praising people who say tomorrow, religiously, politically, economically, things are going to be better and, and nothing changes. So, the wicked king had what he wanted, which was, by the way, which was a sense of being someone, even a sense of being a good man. Well, am I not a good man? I have all these plans, which he manufactured out of his own neurosis, out of his own sickness, first deluding himself, then of course deluding everyone else out in the kingdom. One day, well, they're all going about their business, and the king was in his royal palace. There was an earthquake, a shaking of the ground, and everyone became frightened. A little later, another earthquake. All the people start chasing around, wondering what's going on. And the king, the king, of course, pretended that he understood the situation. Do you know, do you know how the experts lie to you all the time? Do you know that they don't know? And so they resort to their old nature, which is to lie to you. And you stupid people! Why do you think kings like that exist? Because there are stupid citizens and no other reason. If you woke up, he wouldn't have a chance. Well, anyway, the ground shook terribly and the people scurried around in horror at what was happening. And the king... Does this sound familiar to you? I, I wonder if you're going to believe what I'm going to tell you next. Let's see if you can. I'm telling you, I know. I know the minds of rulers, leaders. The king said, we've had a disaster somewhere. The earth is shook. And I understand that the buildings fell down in town 50 miles away. I, I don't know what to do with myself today. Uh, no entertainment. I know what I'll do. Heaven help you if you don't believe what I'm telling you. You think I'm going too far. I don't go far enough. I can't because you'd never believe it. The king said, I have nothing to do today. No amusement. I had sex last night. I don't want it today. So he said, I know what I'll do. I'll take a compassionate tour of the poor citizens whose house, houses were ruined. So he took a tour, he got in one tour all throughout the building, nodding his head sadly all the time. Do you know why he took that tour? 
He was excited. You know how people, some of the disaster happens, people all want to rush to it. He had first, ch first chance at it. You can see all the ruins and see all the people all the time playing the game. Is there one person in this room who believes what I am telling you? Do you know they all do it? They get in their airplanes and they see the fire disaster or whatever it is. And then they make the proper proclamations. And when they're all done, they've had their amusement for the day. Don't you know that leaders use a nation as a toy? Nothing but a toy for their personal pleasure. And again, you stupid people, when are you going to wake up so that you could do your part to stopping it? Well, anyway, after a while, after a number of severe shocks, some strangers appeared in the kingdom and they identified themselves as royal engineers from another land. And they told the king and the populace they said, you'd all better leave here fast. We came here to investigate. We saw the earthquakes too. And let me tell you something, king and citizens. Let me tell you something, the engineer said. Your kingdom is built on a false foundation. You have all these marvelous plans for doubling food, for giving everyone a home, for making everyone happy. You have all these plans for this kingdom of yours and you don't know that it has a false foundation and those earthquakes are the beginning of the destruction of it. And what happened, of course, is the king, fearing the loss of his power by telling the people the truth, he said, there's nothing wrong, these men are mad. Let's send them on their way, which they did. And the kingdom collapsed, the nation collapsed. And all the people were wounded and hurt and desolate. And as the royal engineers stood there and looked at the ruination of the people, they looked at the people and then they looked at themselves and they nodded and they said, this is the way it always happens. You, you, you can't tell people anything. If you tell them that there's something wrong with their life, they say, well, what's wrong with your life that you have to tell me that? The possibility of this existence of truth in this world is so remote, most people don't find it. Now, that kingdom was built on human plans, human delusions, human sickness. Everyone, everyone quietly mad. Do you know that when you describe a lost human being, one who's apart from reality, do you understand that when you describe him or her as insane, it is the most perfect description you can have of that person? It covers everything. If you say that man living 10 blocks down the street and that woman across the street from him, if you say they're insane, that is the perfect description. Don't you ever back up from it. And don't you ever tell them that or they'll prove it. And you're in trouble. Now, aren't you tired of your plans? No, you're not. Don't nod your head to me. If you were tired, you would begin to change because if you're tired of your plans, then this divine purpose, this spiritual purpose that we talked about would begin to come in and force it out, would begin to replace them so that you could go through your day in a different way. Oh, what a relief! Is there one of you here tonight is there one of you here who is tired of trying to conquer the world? Are you still trying desperately, frantically? And are you afraid? Are you afraid here tonight? Are you afraid to give up trying to conquer the world? Do it anyway. Do it even if you are terrified of doing it. Do it anyway. Just give up. 
And I want to tell you how to do that. We've seen the problem. Now here's the solution. Please practice this for years and years and years. It will be partially familiar to you, and then I'm going to add something to it. You remember you were given the exercise of catching yourself when you're walking. And please confine this for now to when you're walking around anywhere at the home, here, anywhere else where you can carry it out. You've been told to practice the exercise of catching yourself in a mental movie, of a revenge scene, you're telling someone off, a scene where you're powerful, or a scene where you're worried. You've been told to do that, correct? All right. Now here's a, an extra beneficial addition to it. The next time you catch yourself doing it, let's place it at home, make it very specific. You're walking around your home, cleaning the house, doing whatever you do. And all of a sudden, you come to the end of your little dream state for the moment, your mental movie, your dramatic production. Well, how many of you do this all the time? Raise your hand, everyone raise your hand. All right, but now you come to the end of it. And because you've been working on yourself, you suddenly say, ah, I caught myself, there I was, running the scene through my mind with that other person. It's often with another person, isn't it? I caught myself. Now here's what you do. Here's the special device, marvelous. Let's say that when you ended the scene, you found yourself in the kitchen, when you ended it. And you get to thinking, ah, I was changing the bed, bed sheets in the bedroom. And I think that's where it started. The best I can recall, that's where it started. You following me? You go back to that bedroom, walk on back, and walk on out to the kitchen where you finally woke up, and you stay awake for those 30 steps. Don't let yourself get away with sleep. Let's go over it again. You've got the bed and the room all fixed up, and you've dusted it and all that. And so you start out of there, and as you leave, the dream starts to capture your mind, right? You get out into the kitchen, and when you get there, it has run its course. The energy invested into that by automatic accident has worn itself out, exhausted itself, and all of a sudden you're aware that you're in the kitchen. This is for students, you understand. Only students can do this. And all of a sudden, ah! I wonder where I started that. Ah, probably back in the bedroom. A certain picture on the wall reminded me of a certain thing, and that started the whole dramatic production. You go back there, and you walk consciously, knowing that your hands are swinging at your side, you walk consciously from the bedroom to the kitchen. If you fail the second time, you will do it the third time, the fourth time, the fifth time, until you walk, until you walk those steps wide awake from your bedroom into the kitchen. Isn't this marvelous? Now you expand that. And you do it in your own ways. Wherever you catch yourself coming to an end of a daydream, go back to where you were physically. Start all over again. And if you fall asleep again, do it over again. If you fall asleep halfway, catch yourself, go back. You'll be astonished what a different life you have, how different you feel about everything, because the, all these negativities are being shut out by your staying wide awake, staying conscious, you're not being kidnapped mentally. Is it clear to you? Do this over and over again, and watch how your plans begin to vanish, and true purpose begins to enter and guide your life. I would like you to put under a microscope and study intensely the following situation, which is that human beings, including yourself as a human being, cannot follow orders, but more specifically, that a human being cannot follow orders exactly as given. You can't. There's no way you can. There's too much of you in the way to take right orders, true orders, healthy orders, and simply follow them out 
precisely as given for your own benefit. Now, it is well known, is it not, that it is easier to see faults in other people than in ourselves, huh? So, we will use that as a starting point for seeing ourselves eventually with the inability to simply do what you're told to do. So from now on, watch other people, wherever you see them, wherever you might have a little bit of right social authority, you're the boss of the company or you ask someone, the child to do something or whatever. From now on, put under a microscope the inability of human beings to follow orders, actually at all, to find someone who can take right instructions and carry them through from A to Z it is extremely rare. So your first exercise is to see when you ask someone to do something, they don't do it as you want it to be done, assuming that you're accurate about it, you know, an everyday thing, maybe you ask someone to do some work or whatever, and you want it done in a certain way because you know it's either the right way or it's the way you want it done. Sometimes there's a matter of choice where you could do things quite different, but in this case, you ask someone to do something the way you want it done because it pleased your personal preference. You wanted the, the curtains in your house done a certain way, a certain shade of color, I don't know why, but you want a, something done in a certain way and you get the curtains back or you get your automobile back or whatever and you look at it and you know it wasn't done according to your instructions. Now listen to this. This is such a commonplace thing where you can't get things done the way you wanted that you, you give up on it and you don't even notice it anymore. It's only when it's extreme that you suddenly get resentful and say, this isn't what I ordered. First exercise, you see how human beings cannot follow orders at all, and again, to find someone who can follow them exactly as you gave them to them is a, a miracle in itself. Now, of course, all this is to give you an awareness of how you can't do it. We're simply starting out there because it is easier to notice the lax work of other people, but we're course we want to find it in ourselves to see why are we doing all this why are we talking about this because we have a spiritual aim in mind we want to be able to follow the orders of something higher than ourselves instead of listening to ourselves and getting everything all mixed up and not getting a reward for it I'm going to tell you an illustrative story which will precede and follow this marvelous point of us acquiring the ability to do what we're told to do. There's a governor of an island out in the Pacific somewhere. And this governor understood from looking around at the commerce and trade around the island that he needed 10 new boats. These boats were to go fishing and to carry commerce to the other islands, to transport people, take care of tourist needs and so on. So he needed 10 new boats to service the island. So here's what the governor did. He called in 10 different boat builders, got them into a hall and said, gentlemen, we need 10 new boats, one for fishing, one for tourists, and so on. And I'd like you to build these boats for us. Now, gentlemen, Listen carefully to what I'm going to tell you. Don't miss it. Don't miss it for your sake. Now, gentlemen, each one of you will be given precise specifications, blueprints, instructions on how we want the boats built. Each one a little bit different. One has to be larger, one smaller, one narrower, one with more uh, space for equipment or whatever. I am going to hand you individually this specification for this boat and this one and this one 
And I want you to go out and build the boat exactly as you were instructed to do. Now, gentlemen boat builders, listen especially careful to what I'm going to tell you next. If you don't build your boat 100% as instructed to do, you don't get paid. Gentlemen, you can just forget all about labor unions here. You can forget all about you wanting to build it your way. You will build the boat exactly as instructed or you don't get one penny for it. Understood, gentlemen? They all nod their head. We understood, Governor. Yes, sir. We know exactly what you're talking about. Six months later, all ten boats came back. And the governor had his captains test them, put them through the various tests. And then he called the ten boat builders in, seated before him, and he said, Gentlemen, I have some news for you. None of you get paid one cent. I told you, I warned you, I gave you instructions. I want these boats built exactly as I want them, not according to the way you want them. Details, gentlemen? Be glad to give them to you. I, I told one of you men I wanted the boat a certain width. There was a reason for it. There's a certain pair of rocks out in the channel there, and this boat has to go out there, and you build it wrong. That boat can't pass between those rocks. You don't get paid. I ask another of you to put a certain amount of sail equipment on one of the sailboats we wanted to use. You did it wrong. We did it because we know the, the boat itself in relation to the weather, to the winds, to the currents, to everything else, to storms. Gentlemen, I know what I'm talking about and you refuse to obey. You don't get paid. Follow? Truth, reality says to every one of us, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm doing when I give you precise instructions. You don't. You don't know about those two rocks out there. I'm an expert in the harbor, in the weather. I know why I told you to do it this way instead of that way. Ah, write down a sentence while, or think of it while I'm talking. Too much of you spoils the new. Every one of those boat builders, they get the blueprints and they went to their office and they spread them out. And they said, oh, I don't like this, I will change it to that. And here's another thing I don't like. I'll change this just a little bit, no one will notice. Do you, do you think truth is stupid? No, you're projecting. You are stupid and you think that everyone else is like you are, including God. Have you noticed something? Have you noticed you haven't been paid? Let that be a clue to you that there's something wrong with you, not with the instructions. I know how incredibly strange it may sound to you that God knows more than your mind does. I know how shocking that is to egotism, but it just happens to be a fact. Ah, oh, we're so... Can, can you see it? You have to, now comes the application for you. Can you see how we're so loaded with our own desires, our own little trickeries? Well, he won't, truth won't notice that. The governor of the island won't notice that little thing. And I think it will make it better. What you think would make your life better has worked out to the exact opposite, hasn't it? It made it worse. You're still wandering around. Wondering why, wondering why, and feeling resentful that you don't get paid. You think you can pull your little tricks, stay in your own little self-centered world, and get paid for it. Of course you're going to get paid, but you're going to get paid with more of you. How terrible. Details for the way out. You have 
certain conditions in your life, certain wrong conditions. You have the way you misthink. You have these things we talked about before, all of which prevent you from following spiritual orders. You have your own self-protective devices. You have your own little ways of hiding out from reality while pretending that you're not. You have your, listen to this one, you have your own tricky little ways of attracting attention to yourself from both other people and from yourself. You see, it's essential when you're neurotic to continue to feed yourself with attention about yourself, which simply means thinking self-thoughts. The old squirrel cage process why, by which you keep thoughts about you churning around inside your mind all the time. And if it begins to slow down, then you think of some, some device to keep it going all the time. Now, you have certain inner conditions which you cherish, which you hang on to, which prevents you from building the boat according to specifications, from building your life according to the higher specifications of reality, which if you were to follow the orders exactly, you would find that you would indeed get a reward of which you know nothing as yet. Now, again, remember or write down the following phrase. It is the very key, one of the keys, to what we're talking about now. I said you had these conditions, thoughts, emotions, ways of living, ways of reacting inside of you. Now here it is. Oh, what a beautiful statement. Don't call yourself your conditions. See, wherever there is something faulty, something stubborn, something stupid, unconsciously you call yourself that condition. You think in your delusion that it is necessary for you to be continually naming yourself, labeling yourself, assigning virtues to yourself that you don't have, and even having the pleasure of assaulting yourself, criticizing yourself. You'll do anything to keep the world centered around your imaginary self. So when I told you to no longer call yourself your conditions, you were on the path to setting aside the egotism, the insistences that prevent you from following orders. These conditions that you have, your ways of reacting, for example, These conditions that you have are the only life you have and it is the life that is destroying real life from preventing real life from coming to you. So if you will begin, again, you have to catch yourself beginning to do it. If you'll catch yourself calling yourself a condition, that very thoughtfulness toward catching yourself, thinking about it, you can say, wait a minute. Now, just a minute, just a minute. I worried about this or that. Now, one of the right instructions I heard for building the boat life, the right life, one of the instructions was to not call myself that condition, to not say that I am not that worry, that I am not that worry. I see that I must no longer want to be that state of worry. Ah, I see that at the moment I worry, that is all that exists inside of me. That was my whole life. What a shock to see that I have to give up my whole life. But all of a sudden, I make the connection that that is what I have to do. 
It's been trying to nudge itself into my system all these years. I heard about it when I was a little girl of 10, little boy of 10. I heard about it. I heard someone say, in order to get a new life, I have to give up the old life. Ah, the intelligence of that is beginning to creep in. Ah, and I see I don't want to do it. It's the last thing I want to do, but I see its necessity. Someday, you're going to have this experience of just a little bit of ray of light coming into your system and becoming a strength for you. See, uh, you don't get it yet. Let me tell you what you don't get. You don't understand that one of the conditions you now have is the condition of saying, if I can only find my own strength, that will push away the worry, solve the problem, make me happy. If I can just find the right set of thoughts, the right plans, if I can just find the right set, that's it, that's my problem. I haven't met the right man yet. Oh, ladies, I haven't met the right woman yet. No, men. I haven't met the, the right guide or whatever. See, you still think that strength resides somewhere in your plan in your conditions, but you simply haven't found it yet. And so you go on to the next illusion of thinking, hopefully, <clears throat> okay, all is not yet lost because one day I will find what I know is there. And you don't know it at all. You assume it. You believe it, you imagine it, you hope for it. Abandon all hope because you're not going to find it where you're looking inside your own intellect, inside your own conditions. Now comes the challenge. <clears throat> and you don't even need the, your own strength. You can't have your own strength to see that you're looking for strength in the false, wrong place, non-existent place inside of you. What you can do, what you can do, ladies and gentlemen, is collapse. What you can do is to have no more fight in you at all, no more search in you at all, no more desperation to say, well, if it isn't on Monday, I'll find it on Tuesday. If it isn't on Tuesday, I'll find it on Wednesday. If it isn't in October, I'll find it in November, or certainly December. See. See what a, what a, ah, I'll use the word. See what a vicious trick you're playing on yourself. See how you keep the squirrel cage going. See how you keep the storm going. See how you refuse. See how you refuse to give up. See how you, as the builder of that boat, know more than God Almighty. God. God comes to you and he gives you the instructions. He gives you the truth. And he says, boat builders, ladies and gentlemen, boat builders, I know what I'm talking about. And I hand it to you. Take these instructions and build your boat according to that. And all will be well. You will be rewarded for it. But you have one last trick left. And after that one last trick, you have another last trick. Yeah. You understand that, don't you? I know you do. I know why you reacted to that, because there's a sensing of your own self-trickery in that. I will try to say it in a new way. If you will take the instructions by the way, the pure instructions that you hear in this room and read in the books that you see in this room and the cassette tapes that you hear, 
if you will take those instructions and let them begin to be a new kind of strength, a new kind of guidance for you, but let's stick to the word strength. If you will let them be strong for you, that will, in turn, begin to dislodge you with your false strength, your fantasies, your preference, your, your wish to build things, eg the build ex the boat exactly as you want to build it because you think that is what will serve you. If, if you will let truth do it, you will begin to understand that the only way you can ever have a happy life, to use that simple term, happy life is to follow the instructions that were given you instead of saying, instead of saying, I know what is best for me. Now look, examine that. Here you are, you've been given the instructions for building the right kind of boat and you take it home and you read it and you say to yourself, oh good, I like this, but I know why I, it is necessary for me to change the length of the boat a little bit. Why I should put a, a higher sail on it. I know, I know why I should change these several things in the boat and then bring them back and present the boat for payment. I know why. The reason why I should do that is because I would feel safer. I will feel more comfortable. I will have the pleasure of saying that I had something to do with the building of this boat from my own original self on and on you justify and explain why you should get yourself into the boat building process because you say then I will feel satisfied oh what a horrible mistake because you so casually slipped in the phrase could because then I will be satisfied and you refuse to see your use of the word I. Who's going to be satisfied? There is no one who's going to be satisfied. As long as you were there, you're going to be dissatisfied, to put it mildly. You're going to be very sick about results. See, the self, the I, is very, very tricky. It says to you, it says, if you give me, feed me what I want, then we'll both be happy. See, you get a split personality already. It says, if you will f give me these certain things, then you'll feel a certain thrill of having strength, safety, power, and so on. That's what you will have. And because you settle for that sick advice from the voices in your own mind, because you settle for that now, tomorrow you will have to do the same thing. Because you have taken the thrill of saying, I as strength. Go over that one again. You say, ah, if I change this, part of the blueprint and add something to the boat, then I will feel that I have contributed something to it. The I is neurosis. The I has contributed its own sickness to the building of the boat. So what do you expect to get but a boat that's unserviceable, that's warped, that is of no value at all? And you thought it was going to be valuable even while working on it. You have that plan. What is it? Financial, social, educational. What plan do you have that you say, when I get through with it, I'm going to get rewarded? See, and the, what your reward will be a sick reward, which does indeed feed your old nature, but, but in horror, you have to keep 
doing the same thing every day, every week, every month, every year? Have I described your life exactly and you know I have? Now, you take the instructions and you be receptive to it. And you begin to go against your old nature that wants to take that list of instructions and go against the tendency to pick up the pencil and cross ten words out and write your own ten words in its place. Or you go against the tendency to pick up the pencil and write down five more instructions to it. See, addition and subtraction. This is the way our minds work. Pure truth is too much for us. It's too much for the old nature. If you can catch the old nature with its subtleties and deceptions, if you can catch your mind reaching over for that pencil to take something to cross out. See, you, the reason you cross it out is because you threat, you feel that it's a threat to your egotism, to the way you want to do things. Why don't you try an experiment sometime? You try an experiment of looking at the instructions, truth, truthful ideas, and just follow one of them completely. Just take a little short one somewhere. You have to get your own examples of this. Some little truth about life, about talking to someone, about going up and, and watching how you go into a false smile, for example. And the instruction is you don't have to go, you are never, never, never required to go into social strain under any conditions before anyone. I don't care where you are or who you're with. God does not require you to be strained. All right, now there's the instruction. So you go into a situation, and the first thing you have to watch is that you want to change the instruction. Well, I've got to put on that phony smile. If I don't put on that phony smile, they'll, they'll think I'm depressed or something, and I'm supposed to be one of the spiritual leaders of the class. See how, how we talk to ourselves and try to change things around to keep ourselves looking right. You try the experiment of following one little short instruction 100%. You follow it 100% and you know what the result will be. If you don't, I'll tell you, you'll get paid. And the, re and the payment, first of all, be begins for you saying, thank God, there is someone more intelligent than me. I didn't know it before. But now I begin to see it because I saw the lessening of my compulsive need to put on the forced smile. And oh, how, really, truly, now listen, I'm talking about a really good feeling. You, you, you have none of that. All you have is phony good feeling that you escape the trap of, for a moment or something. Oh, a feeling that will go through your whole system. You will feel good that you don't have to waste your life anymore forcing a smile or being a big fake in other people. That's your reward. Specific instructions for using all that you have heard today. This is a, a private exercise. You do it at home. You take a piece of paper and a pencil, and you write down and list in one sentence or so. List all the things that are preventing you personally from following the instructions. Just write them down one after another in your own words. Go ahead. Put down uh, vanity, whatever it might be. Put down an awareness that I am, am distorting the instructions. See, because if you become aware of it, then you won't do it anymore, because awareness conquers darkness, doesn't it? Make a long list and look it over. Add to it. Put as many as you want. Fewer as many as you want. Use it as a day-by-day -day project, whereby you can begin to understand that in your present state, you are incapable of obeying the orders of God, of truth. When you see your incapacity 
you will also see the reason why you're not getting this reward of a nice feeling of a pleasant life of being in command of yourself and therefore in command of the whole world in command of the whole world you'll understand by the way what it means to be in command of yourself is the same thing as being command of everything the, not the world the universe in command of time for example write them down make the most of the list keep it up for a long time and let the truth itself instruct you as you go ahead with the project all right Let's set the scene for something that is imperative for you to listen to, absorb, understand, and live. Imagine a railroad track stretched out thousands of miles ahead. Now, a man is walking in between the rails walking home, trying to get back home. As he walks, he is suffering terribly from the heat because from where he starts his journey back home, it is dry, hot, barren desert. No shade, little short bushes, cactus. Intensely hot, no water. Nevertheless, he wants to make the trip. He's lived underground out in that desert for so long. He's determined to make the trip back home. And he understands what he's getting into. It's going to be rough. He faintly understands it. He more senses it than understands it. So he gets between the railroad tracks. He stays on the tracks. In this case, we'll say he doesn't deviate left to right or go off into detours. He strays between the tracks as the tracks lead home, and he senses that. So on he hikes day after day and week after week, and oh, the conflict and turmoil and the, the uncertainty. Have you ever noticed the pain of not knowing in your life? This is it, isn't it? The suspension. If I only knew yes or no, that would be something, but you can't find yes or no. All right, the sickies of the world have a yes, but it is their yes. It's their precious book that they run to because they can't think for themselves. It's the hymns they sing and all the religious and non-religious things which they take as doing what is right for themselves. So he's in this terrible state of suspension and uncertainty, and he, like you, has said many times, I know how to get over the pain of not knowing what to do. I can go back where I was before, but it's too late. Aren't you delighted, overwhelmed that it's too late for you to go back to the underground desert play? Aren't, it's terrible, isn't it? It's marvelous, isn't it? Yeah. So he keeps walking, and here is his first spiritual reward. After miles and miles, hundreds of miles, he is suddenly aware of a different feeling inside himself. And he looks around and tries to see the source of it, because it's a, a comfortable feeling, very small. He's 99% hot, but 1% cool. And this is new for him. And he wants to know the source of that, doesn't he? Because he wants to get more. So, you see, don't you know that most people walk through life like that? You know, you see him walking around streets. You see him in this room walking like that, you see? So he looks up a little bit. He wakes up, he shakes his head, and he opens his eye and he looks around. And he sees the source of his very brief temporary feeling of coolness and what he sees is that there's a tree on either side each side that has grown up over and for just that long say six yards that stretch of the track he was in shade right had ever had that yet have you had it yet oh six yards that's all but boy girl you know the difference in the feeling don't you so he keeps going 
And here's what happens to him. With increasing both frequency and length of the shaded area, with increasing frequency, he runs into the shaded area. Not all at once, it's still a long time, a long, hard hike, isn't it? But more and more shade and less and less hot sun. So on and on he goes, and now he is sort of at a certain point alternating between the heat and the cool shade, and there's water there, plenty of water. See, the trees know there's water underground, don't they? And so they go down there, and so you know there's water, and so you see the water right beside the little little uh, shady spot there. Now, that's the scene. Now, we're talking about ourselves and the spiritual hike. Spiritually speaking, what does it mean when he leaves a shady stretch, say, of a half mile, leaves a shady stretch and suddenly gets out into the sun where all of a sudden he's blasted again. And it's a very familiar experience, isn't it? He's had that all his life. The sun, the hot stretch out there, listen, that is simply because you forget yourself. Now, your old nature, the nature you had as a little boy and a little girl, and up until a teenager and up until now, that old nature is pretty hot, burning, burning with anger, envy, whatever. So you're quite familiar with that. But you've started along the railroad tracks, and you've got your first feeling of new life, of coolness, something that isn't hot. Oh, but you're not very strong yet because you haven't traveled far enough yet. You see, way on down there, it's nothing but shade, but you haven't reached that yet. So you go into a shady spot. Ah, oh, how nice. How, this is what I want. This is the way I want to travel for the rest of my life. And then you go out into the sunny stretch again because you were distracted by something of the sun, of the heat. There is still... Oh, I see you're all mixed up inside. There's something in you that still yearns for the wilderness, for the hot stretch. What is it? You, you see, you fill in the blanks as I'm talking. What powerful emotion in you takes you away from the cool, shady stretch where you can walk with ease and plenty of water, and it's, it's even quite enjoyable. What is there in you that suddenly makes you walk into the hot spot again because there is still, how incredible this is, because there is still a preference for it. See, see how difficult it is for us to fall in love with what is real and what is permanent for us way on farther down the line. So don't miss this point now. This is one of the main ones. You suddenly fall into depression. How many of you get depressed, still get depressed, see? You fall into depression. Why do you fall into depression? Simply because you prefer it. You have forgotten what you once felt, what you once tasted. Why don't you remember that? I told you there's such a thing as spiritual memory. Why don't you remember that instead of the glorious pain, pleasure, pain, ple hyphen, pleasure, of the hot stretch. You don't have to walk there at all. It is not required of you. And if you were to wake up, it would all be cool and watery. A very pleasant journey. Now, now here, look at it again. The man is walking through 10 miles of heat. He's perspiring and he's, and he's thirsty and he's loaded with resentment. How did I get here? Why was I ever born into a sick world like this? See, that's the, I see the eye talking there. Why was I? You weren't. You thought you were and you still think you were. You were never born into this sick world. A physical body was. 
and an opportunity to grow out of the sickness of this social society, social world that we live in. You were born as an opportunity, but you take that opportunity as you, and you cry, see, see that, that sickness and egotism are exactly the same thing. All right. You're walking along burdened, complaining, bitter, utterly self-centered, cheerless, snarling. Just look. How's this sound? Just looking for a fight. Does that describe your mind sometimes, your spirit? Just looking for a quarrel with someone. Just hoping they'll make the slightest mistake so pounce goes the hawk. All right. Now, you walk up. After five miles in that intense heat, you walk up and enter the shade. You have to keep your parallels going here. You enter the shade, but how can you recognize it as a shady stretch when you carry into the shade your old, hot, resentful, hateful nature? You carried it in, therefore it doesn't exist for you. It exists, but not for you. You carried that last thousand miles of heat and hatred into it, so how can it be there for you? See that your nature, whatever it is, is everything. If you change your nature, that cha changes your whole world, because your, whole, your nature as it is, is your whole world. Now, for a human being who has stuck with it, no matter how confusing, how painful, never mind the confusion, I've told you many times, just keep walking. Ignore the confusion. It's trying to trick you. Confusion is trying to trick you and take you back into a hot stretch. You finally get to the point where there is nothing but a cool walk back home. Why? Because simply, this is your nature. Your nature is the cool place. This is the only thing that exists for you because you've understood throughout that 5,000 mile hike the mistake you have made, that you've simply fallen in love with being forgetful. You prefer it. You know, the very plain illustration, you take a man who's in that bright, hot heat, and you put him in, in a cool place, and, and it's so different. He says, wait a minute. This is different so that it is, must be the enemy, right? By the way, this is what happens to people in, in their human relations. You come here, and you meet other people who have even that much of the wish to make it to the shady place. You meet them and you will twist their character according to what you are. You understand a new person does that? All right, but that's a side point. So here we are, the man or woman walking along the, the railroad tracks, going through all these experiences. Someday, at one point, it will occur to him quite clearly what is happening, and here it is. I just said it, I'm gonna say it another way. If you are inwardly different, then everything out there is different. Now, if you are cool and green inside, your whole world is there is no other world for you. It doesn't exist. You can look back and see a lot of people following you along on that stretch of tracks, and you can understand perfectly what they're going through, can't you? You, know, you complain, ah, that's me, that's me five years ago, ten years ago, six months ago. You see what they're going through because you've come through it yourself. Now, you don't any longer have to be in love with what is burning you up. I am telling you that the first green spot of just six yards exists 
in front of each one of you here. And I know what will happen when you enter that. You'll look, what, what's going on? And your pace will quick. You'll want to get to the next one as fast as you can. This is, this is the point where God, truth, reality begins to take over your life so that you feel yourself impelled to go forward. And it's, it is so easy to walk now compared to before. Because while you were walking before, you, you didn't know what it was all about. And, and you were tormented by the thought. Listen, and you nod your heads at least inwardly. You were torm you'd be tormented by the thought, am I wasting my life again? I, I wait, oh my God. I wasted 30 years of being married. And I thought it was heaven. Oh, it didn't take you long to be disillusioned, did it? I wasted all that time with concern for making a little more money. And, and maybe worst of all, I wasted all that time collecting a lot of friends, a lot of, a lot of things to do with myself and the torment is terrible am I doing it again if there is a single one of you in this hall now or listening to this cassette tape on cassette talk if there is one of you who ever goes away from this fails to come back fails to go on with with your listening to the tapes and reading the book. If there is one of you, you have missed the whole purpose of life which has been given to you by God Almighty himself. I've described you and you know it. All you new people, those of you who have been here for a long time, I've described your life exactly. And part of your heat is the dreadful, furious compulsion to lie about where you are. I'll tell you where you are. You're out walking between those railroad tracks out in that hot desert, hating everything, hating yourself, hating your life, and at the same time insisting that you know where you're going and what you're doing with your life, and you are a horrible liar, and you are being punished and will continue to be punished. And this you understand that you have to let go of the God of your anger. Hostility is what you are worshiping. Thank God I have something to hate. Let me tell you what that is called. It is called total insanity. Aren't you glad that sanity exists? I'm telling you that it exists farther on down the track and you've got your first taste of it when you entered that first shady spot. You just keep walking and you'll understand, first of all, how completely, what, what a lunatic you are and always have been. Every human, listen, every human being who is truly sane, and don't you think that you are, you're not, you're batty. Every human being who has finally arrived at true sanity arrived there because he knew at one time that he was insane. Are, are you willing to give up calling your insanity sanity? If you're willing to give it up, God will do the rest you'll feel it with increasing frequency the, the quiet cool shady spots as you walk between the tracks this is God proving to you himself the evidence of what has been presented to you in words in books in lectures see you are being given words and ideas and thoughts now that it's not enough you want the evidence you can have tr the true evidence or you can have the, the false invented evidence of your own sick religion or whatever it might be. Truth is willing to give you evidence from your own self. And don't you dare think that you already have it. You don't. You're mad. See, this, this hall 
is where the compromise stops and where the truth is given to you with total clarity and total purity. Now, isn't that something to be happy about? <laughs>